Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darren Johnson. I'm Senior Investment Consultant at St. James's Place. I'm delighted today to welcome you all to our latest fund manager event, this time with Milena Maleva from Bailey Gifford, one of the managers of our UK fund and investment manager of the Bailey Gifford UK Growth Fund. Milena is dialing in from Edinburgh today. So welcome, Milena. Thank you very much, Darren. Thanks, everyone, for attending. For many years, this has been one of our most popular funds amongst St. James's Place investors. And in terms of timings, um, I can imagine that the questions posed from the audience will range from the fund itself to events around the world. Um, our aim will be to simplify as much as we can, making sense of the investment side of things, and, and maybe give you some insight into some of the underlying companies that may not be as common to the UK investor as maybe some others. You will, this, Listeners will understand we're here to talk about economic and market issues. So while we are focusing on that area for this interview, we're certainly not downplaying the humanitarian side of current world events that we've all been seeing on the news, et cetera, over the last year. And for obvious reasons as well, we can't necessarily go into party politics as much as some people may want, but we will link a lot of what is going on in the world when we're talking about the companies in which the fund invests. So this will be the usual format for those who've dialed into the previous events that we have held. I'll be trying to make this as interactive and as varied as possible. We've had a, a lot of questions submitted before the event by investors, which is always great. I've tried to group those into key themes, and but you can submit further questions during the event via the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. These sessions work best when they're tailored towards what the audience want to be discussed. So if there's anything on your mind, pop that over and I will ask that on your behalf. It's worth mentioning that due to regulatory reasons, we're unable to make predictions, give advice or answer anything specific to your personal situation. But where those questions do come in, they will be given to your St. James's Place partner to come back to you on. So let's get into this, Milena. Um, Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and while we give people time to put any further questions in, could you give a brief introduction to yourself, your fund and the way that you manage money on behalf of our clients? Yeah, um, no, gladly. Thank you very much for having me again. Um, well, I am um, an investment manager and a partner um, in Bailey Gifford. Uh, my main investment responsibility is um, managing UK specialist portfolios. And, and this is one of my my, my my main portfolios, which I, I look after, and I'm fortunate to do so. Um, and I also sit on a international um, portfolio uh, construction group, um, uh, which invests everywhere in the world outside of the US. Um, so I've got good context um, to kind of assess. It's, it's great for a UK fund manager to, to be part of something like this, because you genuinely get a proper sense of ideas around the world and, and how UK companies actually... Um, look relative to ideas that, that come from Europe or Japan or China or Brazil, you know, anywhere else. So it's uh, it's very useful for me to have that perspective as a UK specialist fund manager. Um, I joined Bailey Gifford as a graduate. Um, that's how most most of our people um, join. The vast majority, we, we, we have a successful graduate program. We grow our own investment talent um, um, that has worked well for us over the years. Um, we tend to take the view that you invest through good times and bad. Um, um, it's a, an important thing to do as a fund manager. Um, and yeah, um, I've covered a fair few different markets and settled on the UK. And that's um, it's my biggest love, so to speak. So I've done that for a good 10 years now, um, investing solely in the UK market. So it's a market I hope I understand well. And um, I, I certainly have great fun trying to find investment opportunities in the UK. And, and and we'll be going into some several of those investment opportunities um, later yeah. on in the session. Um, I try and structure these by almost where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. So the yeah. investment opportunities will be in the where we're going section. Now, unfortunately, when we're talking about where we've been, this is where we have to talk about some of the doom and gloom things, the, yeah. the, the, the stuff that people read, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, from an overall context, having invested, as you said, for, for many years, but the focus of, of of many headlines is on the most recent times. How, how would you sum up the last three years when you actually look back on it, how much the world's had to adapt, but also how much you've had to adapt with the fund as well? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it has been a bit of a roller coaster, hasn't it? Um, I mean, there's always exogenous events that come in, um, but I think we probably had our fair share over the last three years. Um I, I mean, I think from a, from a business perspective, because first and foremost, I'm a fundamental business analyst. Um, so I observe companies um, and it, it has been a, a challenging environment for, for companies the coming going into COVID, coming out of COVID, because um, clearly it, the, the volatility 
businesses have seen in terms of demand, um, the, the shifting patterns of demand, the amount of costs that have come in um, as we've come out of the pandemic with all the supply chain disruption. I mean, these are all these are all things that make it very challenging for, for all companies, I think. Companies we own, companies we all do, don't own, all businesses have had to contend with it. I think it's quite quite easy to investors kind of sit in ivory towers sometimes and, and forget that, you know, if you're out there running a real business, it's been a very difficult time um, because it's just very difficult to forecast and plan in times like this. I mean, it's always difficult to do these things. It's always a more of an art than, than a science to plan your around your business, isn't it? Um, you know, I'm a partner here, so we run our own business, and I know that now it's not an easy thing to do. But um, I think it's been it's been just more challenging than usual um, to do that. So um, I think that's the starting point. I mean, the market's been even more extreme than that, um, as it happens with the market sometimes. So the the, the extremes, the extreme volatility in the market's even more more um, sharper and more brutal than the underlying reality, um, which. You know, comes with its challenges and opportunities, um, particularly for a very highly active portfolio such as this one. I mean, this portfolio has an active share of ninety percent. Um, it looks like nothing like the benchmark, um, which is which I think is good. Um, but it will there will be periods where the market is very top down driven and it's not so much focused on fundamentals and um, it's more the big picture stuff that drives share prices. Um, and, and, and those times will generally be less comfortable. I mean, they have been particularly uncomfortable over the last year for, for the portfolio. Um, but I think the, the key thing is that I think we are coming back now to an environment where the market is looking more at fundamentals. Um, um, and it's it's a more comfortable environment to be in when companies, you know, get rewarded for, for what they what they the performance they generate rather than these these bigger picture macro calls that people people feel to, obliged to make when the world is in an uncertain place. It it certainly feels a bit of an old fashioned thing to say that a company when it makes money the share price goes up. It feels yeah. that that's yeah, that's a very old fashioned thing. It's quite quaint thing. in times like this, isn't it? It's it's really what should be happening all the time, but it it does become a bit weird sometimes. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's it, it's it's refreshing in a way. Um, in that yeah. that's the that's the way it should work, but sentiment drives. Everything, news flow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. in terms of news flow and things, obviously you 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 started uh, as you say a decade ago within the yep. UK. Um, in terms of your process and the way that you're assessing businesses, uh, yeah. as I say, we will get into the businesses and how it looks different than the FTSE 100. I think that's absolutely key. Yes, um, how, how do you analyze a company's prospects today relative to when you first started? Because is it feels like there's far more information in the world, which right, is great yeah. in one way, but in another way, well, maybe there's too much. Yeah. Um, how do you battle with that noise in 2023 relative to how you would have done a decade ago? In a decade ago, yeah. I mean, I've um, I, I've always been very bottom up um, um, in my approach. Um, so for me, it, it is about um, really understanding the, the the idiosyncratic opportunities and risks ahead of a company. I, I'm deeply skeptical of thematic investing. Um, it doesn't suit my temperament, never has. I, I like to understand things. And um, there's a nice phrase, which I, a fellow fund manager, Nick Sleep, uses a lot, which is called, you, you uncover the deeper reality of the business. I, I really believe in that. Um, so I've always I've always done that. I think what, what has changed over time is um, I have become more willing, I think, to weigh up intangible factors um, around the company. And by that, I mean a company's culture. I'm much more willing now than I've been in the past. And then when I started, I would have been a lot more structural in my analysis. In my early days, I would have looked at, you know, the competitive position, the barriers to entry, all these structural things that we look for in businesses, the financial outputs that that reflect the strengths of the business. I would have spent less time trying to get my head around the more intangible cultural aspects of it. Um, and your point around, you know, maybe sometimes you have too much information is a good one. You know, it's the point that sometimes too much information is actually useless. It's the, the stuff that's very hard, hard to quantify and the stuff that's very hard to measure is the stuff that, that really matters. Um, and I think as a fund manager, I've become hopefully better. I've certainly tried to become better at it, but certainly more willing to weigh up a lot of these intangible factors in my analysis than I than I was when I first started. That's right. That's really useful. And 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 just to finish off this sort of where we've been, um, yeah. because the the headlines will continue whether we like it or not. Yeah. Um, the word recession gets talked about 
in, in many different contexts, but it's always yeah. it always fascinates me that that's backward looking. If you're told there's a recession, it means that for the last six months, the, the country or the, yeah. the world has been, has been in recession. Yeah. Um, but for the long term investor who is yeah. you know, the average St. James's Place investor is investing yeah. for a decade or more. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure within Bailey Gifford, that's that's similar. Should a recession generally concern a long term investor if the headlines are going on? Should, should you get caught up in that, really? The, the, there's only the, the only times where it should concern a long term investor is when the underlying asset doesn't have the resilience to deal with one. Um, and it tends to be um, companies which are where the margins and the returns, the profitability of the business is not particularly high. And most of the times, actually, when it becomes particularly difficult is when you have significant degrees of debt leverage, right? I, which is why, on the whole, this fund is invested in things that have very little, if if any, debt, financial debt whatsoever. Um, so I, I think that's, I mean, cruise lines would be a, a good example of that. Um, I, I've never owned a cruise line, but if I was look, looking at something, you know, there are some attractive dri- drivers to the cruise, in, cruise industry, but the returns are very, you know, they're poor the margins are not great. There's a lot of big costs going into it. Um, the competitive dynamics are, are not particularly favorable. Um, and then and then a lot of these companies have a lot of debt, which means when the, the times get tough, you, you, this, this is when it becomes a problem for a longer term investor because you can suffer significant dilution. Um, yeah. But I think if the companies are invest, I mean, the other thing that's obviously important is early stage companies um, by nature are more vulnerable, I think, early stage companies. So you have to make sure that they are adequately financed to go through a what might be just a more turbulent period. Um, because that would be a shame if, if an early stage company, which has massive potential, gets prevented from realizing that potential because it just doesn't have the balance sheet resilience to, to, to toughen it out from, from a macro perspective. You know, there's a few com- there's, there's very little, com- very few companies in your portfolio that are in the St. James's portfolio that are like that. But we have a few small companies. Um, Creo Medical is is a company which we recently purchased actually for the fund. I mean, I think it's one of the most exciting companies in the UK market. It has it, it just fantastically innovative technology. It does surgical endoscopes. Um, it, it also does something potentially. I mean, it's the kind of technology really has transformative impact on human human existence and human health because you're able rather than being opened up in a keyhole surgery you're able to get operated on through an endoscope um which which it's significantly better outcomes for the patient um and huge savings for the system um so it's a very very innovative uh, company but it's it's early stage and it's small it's just signed a very big partnership with one of the big robotic automate uh, robotic surgery companies in the us intuitive surgical which obviously thinks this company has fantastic IP, um, but it's small. It's small company. It's early stage. It's immature. You need to make sure a company like this is adequately financed if you're thinking you're going through a difficult, more difficult macroeconomic environment. So these are the only two examples outside something that has bad financials and a lot of debt um, in a in a very cyclical industry, which generally would not be the kind of companies I would be investing in. And then these earlier stage companies, which are just more vulnerable, and you just need to make sure they are adequately financed through a through a tougher period yeah I, th- I, th- I think over the last decade another thing that's that's happened a lot is that many investors have been let's say steadily reducing their allocation to the uk uh, yeah. increasing their allocation to us technology stocks global equities etc yeah. partly based on past performance partly based on a number of other reasons yeah. whatever the reasons being that 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 trend has been there over the last decade yeah. but looking ahead i mean what what reasons would you give for investors to look again at allocating to the UK? You've just highlighted something there that, that sounds yeah. pretty exciting that's coming out of the UK. I would imagine there's a fair few of those within the fund that we'll go into. But yeah. is it is it about digging a bit deeper than the FTSE 100 to I, find I think so. that kind of? I, yeah, I think so. Because ultimately what ma- makes stock markets go up is, is the wealth, the real wealth that's being created by companies, real companies in the real world. That's what ma- makes, should make the stock market go up over the longer term. I mean, what, what happens over the shorter term is anyone's guess and can be driven by many things. But over the long term, stock markets, they're a reflection of wealth created in the economy. And that's created by companies that are growing um, and generally, you know, doing um, innovative things and, you know, winning in, in big markets. I mean, that's what drives value creation. Um, and I think, that yes, I mean, the parts of the UK market that are not particularly attractive in that sense. 
but there are um, huge amounts of company. And it, I go back to the point I made earlier on around being part of an international portfolio. You know, I get, you know, I see ideas from everywhere and, and I can genuinely hand to heart argue that the, the holdings in this fund, you know, they, they are more, in many cases, more attractive than a hell of a lot of international company ideas that I come across. Um, there's some truly world leading assets, high quality assets in here that I think they just hold their own in, in any context. Um, and, and quite often, actually, to your point, in the UK market has been unloved. So very often they they look on their valuations that are, I think, much more attractive than a than a, an international peer would be. Um, so the reason for look to look at the UK is just, you know, I think active stock picking is important. You know, it won't that won't be applying to the whole market. Um, but I think there are companies in the UK market that are genuinely, I think, genuinely fantastic growth companies over the long term. So and that should generate returns for investors. So let, let's get into a few things then that, that, that the fund does invest in. Um, yeah. I think um, we've, we've had some questions already around that up front. Um, yep. So let's let's dive in. I think yep. you've already highlighted one of the things, which is a, as a ninety percent active share on this fund, which is, yeah. you know, in layman's terms, it means that the uh, the, the, the the correlation to the FTSE one hundred and the like are, is going to be very minimal. Yeah, yeah. If, if if you're expecting the top end of the FTSE one hundred type stocks, then this this part of the UK fund is not doing that. Other managers may do that. Milena isn't doing that. So exactly. what we're going to dig into is maybe some. Some more uncommon things that you wouldn't necessarily hear other UK fund managers yeah. hearing about. Now, Milena, I'm perfectly happy for you to start wherever you want on this. Um, yeah. But I'm just going to ask you, which areas of the of the UK market do you find that has the most value at the moment? And then really, you can take that answer wherever you want to go at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, uh, we, the way we, we, we run this portfolio, that's important to mention. It, we don't position it. Um, in sector wise, so I don't I don't seek out to be overweight or underweight various sectors because I think oh you know energy prices are going up let's buy a lot of oil or um, interest rates are going up or maybe we should invest in banks it's not the way I think about the world at all so it just goes back to this it's about individual companies which are selected on their merit um, and the one thing that they have to have in common is there needs to be a large large growth opportunity right I'm not I'm not um, um, I'm agnostic as to how the growth comes through, whether it's very rapid, very rather it's steadier over time. I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not too bothered by that. But I need to be able to see a very large, and preferably expanding addressable opportunity. And I think if I look at the big holdings in your in your portfolio, I mean they're all. What I like about them is that I think they already are fantastic growth businesses. But what appeals to me is that I think in many of those cases, I think the opportunity is getting bigger. For the companies um, and also the starting level of returns um, is very high, uh, which is which is where I think you make a lot of value, a lot of money as an investor. If you are patient, is companies that have high stable returns on capital and where you think actually this company will grow faster in the future than it has done in the past, because that incremental growth, if you are, if you have a sixty percent return on capital and a lot of your holdings in your top five are making returns in that range. Um, that's very valuable. That incremental 3 4% on the growth rate that you think might be doable over the next 10 years, 15 years, is very valuable then. It makes huge, huge impact to the intrinsic valuation of the company. So I'm a key, uh, this, they're very different companies, um, as I said, because they are so bottom up, but things like, you know, Auto Trader, which is a, a automotive marketplace for, initially it was used cars. Now it's actually a marketplace that you can you can buy a, you can actually buy a car because initially, initially it was just a place where people can find the car. Now it's a place where people can increasingly buy a car, but it's also not just used cars. It's new cars. It's a lot of the manufacturers starting, you know, the likes of Tesla, people that are starting to sell directly to consumers rather than through dealers with, with EV ele electrification. That's a big, big trend in the automotive industry. Uh, you've got leasing companies, you've got loads of companies using this platform because it has a fantastic dominance when it comes to the UK consumer. So that's that's a platform where the addressable market opportunity is expanding. The returns are already very, very high. We're talking 60% return on capital. Um, Games Workshop, which is the largest holding in the fund, uh, it's a completely different business. Um, it has, um, it's a, it's a um, miniature, um, fantasy miniature company. It manufactures um, uh, 
um, miniatures that the people used to play a tabletop game, which is set in this incredible fantasy universe, which is called the Warhammer. Um, and that's a company, again, with incredibly high margins, 60% return on capital. And again, I think one which is now starting, the growth rate is starting to accelerate because it's being able to engage its customers in many, many different ways. It's not just playing the game. It's increasingly playing video games. It's increasingly, you know, they have a, a project with Amazon in the works to do a TV series that, that uses this fictional universe to create to create a TV series. So there's many new ways to engage their, their very loyal and very passionate customers. And that is expanding their addressable market. So I, I like that. Um, Experian is another another holding, completely different again, credit, in, credit service information company. But again, I think the use case is for, for what they have, which is a, a huge data asset of, of credit information for businesses and for consumers, they're becoming a lot more valuable and a, a lot more widely used. Again, very high returns. So anything incrementally you can do more in terms of your growth is very valuable. Um, so th these are the kind of companies I like to invest in. Um, I think what you're highlighting is the need to scratch beneath the surface of the news, to get beneath exactly. interest rates, inflation, recession or not, politics, all this other noise that goes on, exactly, which leads people to the top end of the FTSE because they yeah, even even in, even in industry, even in, in, in places where there is more cyclical headwind, you know, there's, there's clearly a lot of issues around in this country around mortgage, mortgage rates and, 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 and housing market, right? And um, I mean, we, I own and have owned for a very long time, a company called Howden Joinery, which, um, which is, you know, sells kitchens. So it is, it's not immune from what, what is going on within the broader housing market. I mean, they reported just last week and their performance relative to the broader kitchen market in the UK is miles ahead. So it, it goes to the point where you it, some it is about the individual attractions of the company. Does it have a really killer business model? And I think this company does, which has yeah. allowed it to gain a lot of market share. Is it financially very resilient and strong? And you can see how the performance of this company, even in a tough market, is, is just very different to everybody else. Somebody's just put a question in which links into this, and I'd like to bring yeah. this question in if I can. Please do, yeah. One, one of the things you're talking about there is you can have the best business, you can have you can have really good margins, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Somebody just put a really good point. Do you agree yeah. that the quality and the integrity of the management team is fundamental to this? Hugely. And actually, with, with, with the stocks that you're looking at, yeah. the management teams feel even more important Hugely. that they can actually implement the plans. Is that, is that how you see it? Massively so, which is which is, comes back to the earlier point I made. I've become, I think, as a fund manager, I've become more willing over time to really try to think through these implications around management teams and culture. And it's hard to do that because it is intangible. It's it, you know, people people tell you, oh, can you do it systematically? Can you do it rigorously? You know, you can't you can't really plug it into a spreadsheet. But if you look at these companies, the reason why they're so successful is exactly because of the management teams and the way they've executed and nurtured and created competitive advantages, which other people have been unable to do, right? Um, and and that's, that is a crucial ingredient for success. And the only way you can ever properly understand that is if you are willing to hold something over the long term, right? I mean, I always say that the most important thing is that, you know, the portfolio turnover here is 5%. You know, I own things for the implied holding period. That means the implied holding period is, period is 20 years, right? the only time you can really dig under the surface of that the whole cultural piece is to be able to invest consistently with a long-term mindset and not go in and out of stocks. Because um, yeah. I'm, 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 I won't be able to time the market. I'm not as clever as many other folks in the industry are, but I do have that patience. And I think that's an important strength. Pa patience is an underrated Asset. Because it's a very difficult thing to do. It's underrated because it is actually quite a hard thing to do consistently well. In a world with so much, with so much noise. Uh, because I, the, whole, absolutely... the, whole system, the whole system is set up in a way that, that tries to undermine patients. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, talking of patients and, 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 and an industry that's maybe had um, a rough time over the last few years, um, yeah. there's a holding that stood out to me and, and yes. when we talked in advance. I brought yeah. up a, a company called Wizz Air. Yes, um, yeah, but, yeah. So, and, and I think you mentioned cruise liners earlier on, so I'm sort That's of a good point. Yeah, airlines in as well. Yeah, um, are airlines something? Because there's yeah. a lot of noise. Everyone's got an opinion on it. Yeah. Um, 
are airlines something that you see future value in in the UK? Or is it, again, I, I suspect it's company by company, yeah. but what is it about Wizz Air that appeals and others maybe don't? That, that is the crucial point. I mean, I would normally not invest in the airline industry, um, but I invest in Wizz Air and I would, you know, I can't invest in Ryanair, but I'll put Ryanair in the same category. I mean, the only way you win, the, the real structural competitive advantage here is low cost and having the culture to remain ruthlessly low cost because there's been examples in the world of low cost airlines, which have over time become pretty bad businesses because they've lost that ruthless low cost mentality. And I think Wizz Air and Ryanair are outliers in that sample. I think they've managed to retain that. Um, and 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 that's that's what it is. It's 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 winning share versus very bad competition. And again, having the financial resilience, you know, Wizz Air and Ryanair did not have to raise equity during the pandemic, right? They did not have to, you know, they obviously a lot of the airlines, the other airlines, flagship carriers, they have state aid and support, which obviously comes with strings attached. It, it, it's generally, I agree, it's not a good industry, but within that, you can pick a good company. Having said that. You know, Wizz Air, the holding in Wizz Air is, is very small. Um, it would never be a holding like a games workshop. And that's, that's for a good reason, right? Because ultimately, it is not as attractive as an asset, in my opinion. And there's more risks around it than there would be for something like a games workshop or an Experian or an auto trader, things like that. So it is, and there's also, I mean, the big, the bigger, the big issue here over time is, is how you think about um, net zero, right? And climate change. It is obviously a, a, an industry which is not sustainable. Um, yes, they have the best pl the best uh, planes, the most efficient planes, the youngest fleet, but still, you know, it is very polluting. So the risks around regulation, carbon taxes, even demand over the long term, I, I think that are uh, difficult to work out how to discount them. But they are there, and you need to think about them when you, I think, when you are deciding what weight this has in your portfolio as a holding. And, and as I said, Wizz Air has many attractions, but it, there's risks to it. And especially some longer term risks, which are quite difficult to, to price, I think, currently. And I think you need to reflect that in a, in a smaller position. And that, and that brings me on to something else that somebody, somebody's asked during the yes. session here. Yeah. Your, your view on ESG and how you implement that within, uh, within yeah. the dynamics of your fund. You, you mentioned that there with Wizz Air and how you assess that. How, yeah. What's your overall view on it from a, from an ESG standpoint, I know that you haven't got the oil companies and things like that, but it's how do you implement the ESG side of things? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I try to think about ESG. I think the, 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 the ESG narrative is very much always people always pitch it in terms of risks. Right. So people think about the risk when they think about ESG, people think about risk. They think about governance risks. They think about social risks. They think about environmental risks. I think about it as both risks and opportunities. Right. So I think very important when you're trying to analyze a company from from a from a sustainability perspective is to think about both the opportunities and the risks because it's never just risks right in some some ways i think very attractive investments can be things where these um yeah, you you genuinely think the governance or the, the the social impact or the environmental impact the strong positives for the investment case so i think about it both ways um and the way it is for for us it's it's a very integral part of what we do um so we, I as an investor, would look at it and consider it in any company I invest in and, and research. I have colleagues which are specialists in this area, which which work with me and and help me in that process. Um, but it's it's something which which is crucial to the way we invest money. But, and so, technology comes up. Whether I'm interviewing a UK manager, a global manager, anyone, yeah. technology is something that comes in. It's usually seen as a, as, a, as a US thing because that's where Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera, are. Yep. But you hold a significant portion of the fund in IT or what's classed as information technology. Yeah. Um, but the UK doesn't seem, it doesn't get press in the area because it's not, there's nothing the size of Apple, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. Yeah, you, you, you've got, you've got several companies that you know, would tick the IT box in the UK that, that, that look pretty innovative yeah. um, on a smaller scale. Um, can you discuss a couple of those um, and just give an indication of you know, what you're invested in, what clients' money is exposed to, and and and, and almost why going forward? Could you? Yeah, do that? yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I the, the, I think that um, uh, the the spend on IT by corporates businesses um, is is only going one way. Um, I mean, I'm not arguing there won't be cycle there will be cycles to it, but it is a very um, long-term structural growth market. 
um, which, which is a good place to fish for new ideas if you are a bottom-up long-term uh, growth fund manager. Um, not all companies that are exposed to these teams will do well, um, which is which is why I think it always has to come to understanding the individual companies and the specifics around them and why do you think they can be sustainably successful. But I, I do think that the underlying growth in IT spend, corporate IT spend, will be significant and very long term. Um, I mean, I can only I, I can see how how things work in our own business and the amount of the amount of money we spend on cybersecurity and data data center capacity and cloud and right. I mean, all businesses have to invest a lot in this area, um, regardless of, of of where they are and what industries they they find themselves in. So I think it's it's a very interesting growth market. Um, it's about finding the best companies within it. And I think in the UK, there are a few companies that I think are very interesting. Um, um, a company like Softcut, which has been a longstanding holding, um, which is a value-added reseller um, that helps um, uh, clients with their uh, software and hardware licensing and IT needs. We are a customer of them, incidentally, here. Um, a company like Kanos, which is a Belfast a company in Belfast, which nobody would have heard of, but it's been a fantastic success story and a very, very um, long-term growth company. Um, they are a, a one of a, a handful of companies in the world that implement Workday, which is the, the cloud, the HR cloud software, which has been gaining a lot of market share versus on-prem solutions, and you, you oracles of the world and these types of businesses. Um, and in Kenos is a is a very high quality um, company that that helps people implement workday deployments um, in in their businesses. Um, so there's a few of them. Um, I have a company called um, um, FD Technologies, which um, has a very interesting software business, a database, a very very fast time series database, which anything any problem you have, which is big data related, where where you have a lot of a lot of volume and high speed of data that you need to make sense of any application like that is is a perfect application for their technology um and they are making a lot of progress now outside of traditionally they've been used a lot in the financial services industry by big banks and hedge funds and big people that do our algorithm algorithmic trading things like this but now it's starting to expand in a lot of industrial applications particularly with the internet of things and a lot of sensors being put on a lot of industrial machines that that is very helpful. Um, their ability to digest data, huge volumes at huge speeds, is is a, is a great um, great strength in applications like this. Um, so there's a few companies like this where I, I think the, they are um, the genuinely exposed to interesting long term teams. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 always interesting to see the questions come in of yeah the the the, the companies that people pick up on yeah. Um, I, I'm not making judgments here, but Fever Tree seems to be yes, yeah, coming, yeah. Up, coming up a lot, which I could make the link be, between enjoying a gin and tonic and knowing what Fever Tree is. Um, but no, no Fever, Tree, that... Fever Tree has been a disappointing investment, so it's mm. perfectly, perfectly um, accurate and, and important that it should come up. Um, um, Fever Tree has been a, been a disappointing investment over the last number of years. Um, it was one of the companies that um, we were talking about uh, the, the roller coaster that's been COVID. I mean, that's a good example of, of the impacts of the other side of it coming out of out of COVID with with supply chain disruptions, specifically um, um, uh, also the, the the energy price increases because. As, as I'm sure consumers of Fever Tree Tonic would know very well, um, you know, 80% of their product is is glass based, so it's in glass bottles, and and glass is a very very energy intensive um, um, industry, and and clearly uh, cost costs have gone up in this industry a lot, and and they've been passed pass on to the likes of Fever Tree as a consumer of you know large scale consumer of glass bottles. So there's been a big big headwind for their gross margins. Um, the other thing that's been a big headwind for the gross margins for the, in the margins generally has been the, the, the very significant increases in logistics costs, which we saw coming out of the pandemic. A lot of what they now have bottling plants in the US, but that was not always the case. Um, so they used to transport a lot of bottles over to the, to the United States, which is a very important growth market for the company. Uh, and clearly, um, there was very little capacity to transport these things, and it costs a lot of money. To do it coming out of the pandemic where freight freight rates were just skyrocketing so it's been a headwind to profits so the profitability is one of the one of the few companies i'd say in your portfolio where 
the short term profitability hasn't been to my, you know, hasn't been as good as I want it to be. Um, they, they've had to face, you know, deal with these headwinds. Um, uh, the question here always has to be, you know, do you think the long term price is still out there and intact? And are they making progress towards that? And in, in their case, really is about the US market and expanding there. And the, the numbers there have been supportive, the revenue growth has been strong in the US. Um, so do you, you know, are you willing to tough, out, tough it out for a period where the margins are going to be under pressure? Um, what the company is doing, another reason why the margins has been under pressure is because the company has been reluctant to price, to put through price increases of these underlying costs because they don't want to compromise their US growth opportunity, which is which is fairly nascent. Um, so they're trying to keep pricing competitive there in order to build out what's going to be a large market. It's a lot. It's it's a it's a sensible long term decision and strategic decision, but it obviously comes on financial cost in the short term, and 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 that's hit their margins. Um, I, yeah, I, I I often feel with these things when I'm interviewing a fund manager that it's as important to talk about what maybe didn't go as right as yes, they thought as it maybe, is. Yeah. So so I think we yeah. learn a lot more about somebody's investment process if. If it's okay, this hasn't gone right, but this is why we're still holding it. This yes. is this is what's happening. We know why, we understand why, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think you learn more about the decision making at that point. Somebody's asked um, a question uh, again along the along the way of how do you actually decide when to sell something? We talk yeah. a lot about buying, um, but actually, yes. it's just as important to know when to sell. How, how do you assess that? Whether something's gone right or wrong, you still yeah. presumably have to sell it at some point. So, yes. how do you assess that? Yeah, and that's that is. I have to be. I have to be perfectly honest here. Um, that would be always an, a, more of an Achilles heel to my approach, right? I, I, I genuinely believe that um, being patient in long term wins out on average. Um, but there is, as, as any approach, any approach has a trade off to it and, 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 and a weak, weak spot. In my case, it could be that I can be overly patient sometimes with companies. Um, it, it, it is just, it, it is the, the, the truth of the matter. Um, so, um, because it, 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 to the best of one's ability, sometimes it is hard to distinguish between what's structural and what's cyclical, right? I mean, it's been very hard to do that coming out of the pandemic, that's for sure. Um, so, it's it, it, sometimes things do change, though, structurally in the competitive environment. Um, sometimes uh, you, you do actually lose faith in the management team um, to the earlier discussions. And those will be the times where I would make a complete sale. Um, but identifying that with certainty at the time is no easy task. And I will make mistakes um, in, in the process sometimes. So I have to be, I have to be honest with, with, with clients on that. But it's when the circumstances change. Yeah. You want somebody who's going to make a decision along the way. I, I think that's, that's active management that's in a nutshell. Indeed. Um, you know, active versus passive is something that's in the press all the time. And people will hear the noise about, oh, you should, you should always go passive. You should always go passive because that's yeah. what's in fashion right now. How, how do you see the debate where the UK is concerned? Because I think on a global basis, the argument is different than on an individual country by country basis. How, how do you find, so, so for example, the FTSE 100 did very well last year for a very small select number of reasons. But yeah, how, yeah. how do you see that debate? And how do you retain your patience during a period where probably you're hearing, well, it's, what's the point of going active? How do you maintain that patience? Yeah, it's not easy, I guess, to maintain it. But um, I do think over clearly there's evidence that not all managers, but some managers are able to do well um, with active stock picking over the long term. I think that's the case in the UK as it is the case in any other market. Um I, I, I wouldn't go into subtleties of arguing where it's easier or where it's harder. I'm sure some people have opinions on that. Um, I think I think it is possible to have the the both the temperamental and the intellectual traits to be a successful manager, active manager over long periods of time. And actually, also importantly here, the institutional strengths. I mean, I would put that in 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 my company, and of course, I would say that I'm biased, but. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot of a lot of the reason why we are successful as individual fund managers and can be successful as individual fund managers in, in, in Bailey Gifford is because of the institutional structure we have as a private partnership, which is very long term. Um, and um, so it, it is a structure that allows us to invest with freedom, to embrace uncertainty, to take opportunities and to be patient. Mm. Um, and I think those are ingredients that a good active manager should have. Yeah. Um, but you need to be set up in an environment where, you know, if you underperform for a couple of quarters and it looks really badly, 
you know, someone doesn't tap you on the shoulder and tell you you're fired. Um, and and that, so I think that's strength. So I I I think you have to you have you have to have the behavioral characteristics, temperamental characteristics, um, the, the the intellectual capability. Clearly, though, I'll probably run that further down the list. Um, and then actually a supportive institutional structure because human beings are ultimately, we will make mistakes as individual investors. I, I rely a lot on the people around me to know where my blind spots are and to help me, you know, no matter how self-aware you are, you will make errors. And I think this is where you you have to rely on the people around you to, to, to help you out. Mm-hmm. Um, so we work with teams and I rely a lot on the team, in the, to the team around me because um, because of those things, so I, I I think it's possible to be a successful active manager. I I appreciate. The, I'll say that, wouldn't I? I'm an active manager. It's <laughs> unlikely to say anything else, am I? Um, I think that, that, that there's a place for everything. I think everyone's investment solution is different. Uh, the, one of the beauties of the advisory relationship, yeah. from my point of view, where SJP is concerned, is you're talking to an advisor about your specific circumstances, your objectives, your timescales, your risk profiles, yeah. and then your investment solution will be tailored to that. The, 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 the natural press coverage will be, this is it, or this isn't it. Everything has to be binary. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I, there's no room for nuance. There's no time for nuance. Um, but, but I understand that it, it has to come up because active passive is in the news. So, so, yeah. so therefore, I understand why the questions are asked. Um, we are getting a lot of questions, as we always do with UK fund managers, because right. it's yeah. everything. Everything's relatable. So, so, I'm, 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 this may feel a bit more zigzag away. Um, no, not at all. Go for it. Uh, for, from now on, um, when you were talking about technology, someone asked, um, "What are Milena's thoughts? Uh, read the growth potential around utilization of AI." Um, yep. Within those companies, um, look, AI is in the news everywhere. Is that something you're hearing more and more from management teams in terms of trying to incorporate that into their companies? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things. It, um, and I think the pandemic has been very instructive um, on, on that. You know, the old saying, people overestimate the impact of technological changes in the short term and underestimate them in the long term. So I think with AI, um, we are in a very similar positions um, here. I think it would have tremendous impact. I think it's just too early to be conclusive on on how we are going to get there. Um, um, so um, and, and 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 as ever with any great technology, you need to you need to look at the context of of how it's deployed, um, um, particularly in regulated industries, for example where um, you know somebody has to sign up on something and, and take the, the responsibility if things go wrong and if if it's rogue and it doesn't quite work out. So there's all there's as ever there's all these friction points which which over time we work through them and the technology will work through them, but it will make it it's just very easy to overestimate how things how quickly things move in the short term and as I said probably underestimate the impact they will have over the longer term. Um, so I, I think it's it's something that I if I look at my portfolio I I think it's it's hopefully something that will be an opportunity for most of the companies, but I would I would be um, um, weary of you know making very conclusive pronouncements pronouncements at this this stage I think. Um, Which the market can be very definitive in its assumption that this, that, yeah. that, that, that this is the way things are. Um, you know the. It, there's been an AI boom in global markets for the first six months. Yeah. That may be the way it is, and it may not be. Um, yeah. But ultimately, that's that's what's driven the market so far. And that's all. And there's a lot on. about there's a lot about the AI. I mean, I've followed this this space mm. since seriously and systematically um, since probably 2015 and 16. Um, I've I've tried to understand it and 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 build up knowledge here. There's a lot here in terms of um, the, the hardware side, for example, that needs to mature and evolve for a lot of these large scale AI models to properly work and be deployed. There's a lot that needs to happen in terms of the data infrastructure of, of companies themselves to be able to operationalize that, right? And, 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 and do it large scale. I mean, everyone can have a bit of a proof of concept project. Is a question of how do you scale that up across your business? There's a lot of things that need to be put in place before that can happen. So um, yeah, it is exciting, but people need to, um, I think people need to have expect, realistic expectations about how quickly it happens. And again, that's understanding the business, understanding the risks, understanding exactly, exactly. What, what, what can go wrong as well as right. Um, yeah. yeah talk, talking of risk, 
Um, somebody's asked, um, yeah. what keeps you awake at night in terms of risk going forward? Now, this may get doom and gloom, but you know, some, somebody said to us once, um, risk, risk is nothing more than everything that can go wrong, but probably won't. Um, what keeps you awake in terms of what you're focusing on with the stocks that you hold? Well, that's these are the kind of things we already discussed. It's just making making errors of fundamental analysis, um, which I, despite you know, I I try to be um, and my team try to be as as rigorous and as we can be when we research companies. But sometimes we will get things wrong, um, and sometimes things will evolve and change. Goes to the point around you know the dangers of sometimes being too patient. So it's a constant balance that I think you need to strike as a fund manager. Um, and you need to work that out with every single situation and opportunity. So that that keeps you awake every night. You know, it's not it's not 2024, it's 2025, 2023, and 2020, you know, it will be there every year. Uh that's what keeps me awake is how do I get better constantly and in in making sure I I make you know good decisions. My decision making process is good. That's that's what keeps me awake. Yeah. The rest of it, um, the rest of it comes and goes, I think. Yeah. So, so somebody's asked a question here, which I think is 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 a is an interesting one. Is there such a thing as a safe haven in today's world? I suspect I know the answer, but what do you think? I don't think there is. <laughs> I, think if you're, I think if you're going to invest, I think you need to, you know, eyes wide open that there isn't such things, but that actually that does not prevent companies being successful over the long term. Success, yeah. good, good, great companies are able to um to adapt and navigate what we're, what can be very tricky external circumstances and of course you're probably yeah I, th- I think for the long-term investor it's important again it feels like a cliche but your your probability of success increases the longer you invest for That's you've right. already talked about your your average holding period being 20 years the portfolio yeah. turnover of five years uh five percent sorry yeah, five even in years. even in st james's place terms where yeah we, yeah. we go for longer term fund managers yeah yours goes beyond that your active share of 90 percent is huge yeah, this is as divergent away from a mainstream index as as probably as any fund manager we've got. Yeah, uh, and I think that's important to understand. Yeah. Is we've got we we're almost going for not what is big now, what the next wave is. Oh, indeed. And I think and I, and I think that's important for 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 people to recognise. Somebody's asked an interesting question of I, I think you you hold roughly 40, 41 stocks 40, 40, uh, yeah. right 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 now. Um, th- there's no right or wrong of what your number is. I think it, it, yeah. it is fluid. But somebody's also asked, how much time are you spending analyzing other companies? And is there a sort of a, you, they're your plan A. Yeah. How many How many are on the plan B for when the time yeah. is right? So how many yeah. How many stocks are you generally? It's a, it's a great analyze? question. It's a great question because the other um, potential um, uh, behavioral danger with my very patient long-term approach is you um, you have to make sure you look at new ideas all the time. You know the bar for for new ideas coming in will be quite high, but that doesn't mean you don't look at them all the time. It's very easy when you're committed to your to your companies and when you really spend a lot of your mental energy trying to understand them and get this deeper and deeper and deeper understanding each year, not to spend enough time on new ideas. So it's something that I try to be conscious of behaviorally because I know intrinsically I can you know I can make errors on that. So. Um, it, this is where my team has a big role to play because I, I read and engage with research from my colleagues all the time. We have a stock discussion every week and we discuss one or two ideas for you know about three, four hours every Thursday morning. We come together and, and we have a proper debate. Debate is a very important part of the way our team operates. We are an argumentative bunch and we spend a lot of our time discussing companies um, and really, really discussing companies, not just cursory um, discussion. So um, I, I think the new idea is a good question because the new ideas are, they're very important. You need to have them all the time coming through and you need to have the mental capacity and bandwidth to properly engage with them. Um, and that can be a hard thing when you're very long-term fund manager. So it's something I'm aware of and, and try to do as much as I can. Milena, th- th- thank you so much. I, I'm going I'm to have to wrap it up. There's still questions coming in. So where appropriate, we will pick that up with um, sure. the the advisors uh, directly uh, yeah. for, for, from who's, who who asked the questions. Um, but I think we've gone over about as much as we can, in, uh, or we possibly could have done in the timescale. Um, thank you to everyone who, who submitted questions. Unfortunately, we can't get to them all. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the session. But I really appreciate Milena how you've answered everything fired at you. I know a live Q and A isn't isn't easy. Oh, my um, pleasure. 
but, but my pleasure. But, but, but Thanks it. for for everyone's interest. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to everyone who's taken the time to dial in today. Thank you to uh, to um, Emily and Isabel behind the scenes for putting this together once again. Thank you to Melena for taking the time to speak to us. We really Thanks, appreciate Dan. it. Stay safe, stay well, and hopefully see you all again at some point soon. Mm -hmm.